Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. In a follow-up to our previous story on this topic, former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin is arguing that we need to get rid of SpaceX, we need to get rid of Blue Origin, we need to get rid of Artemis, and we need to get rid of anybody who thought that this was a good idea if we really want to get back to the moon. And what we need to do instead is go with SLS, an expendable lander built preferably by his old buddies in the good old boys network, implement a bunch of pricey cost plus contracts, no fixed contracts anymore, and give NASA the kind of budget that they used to have during the Apollo era. All of these are terrible ideas, right? Uh, right? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So some of you may have noticed a story that's been circulating uh, in the general press and sometimes here on YouTube as well, some sort of opinion that was presented to Congress saying that we need to get rid of SpaceX, need to get rid of Blue Origin, those contracts and all of Artemis need to be canceled. Oh yeah, and pretty much get rid of all of NASA's leadership as well and start over if we actually want to get to the moon sometime this decade. The individual who presented this argument was a previous NASA administrator named Mike Griffin. Actually, he heads up a consulting firm these days, and some of the companies that he's advocating should take over for SpaceX and Blue Origin are probably his clients, the Old Boys Network at ULA, Boeing, etc. These are the guys that are going to get us back to the moon to stay, and not these newcomers. Now, of course, I think a lot of you could probably conclude that I'm not a very big fan of any of this. The solution, as you're going to see, doesn't involve a whole lot of reusability. It involves expendable landers, expendable rockets, enormous amounts of expense, basically going back to the way we used to do things with Apollo. Huge NASA budgets, gigantic expendable rockets, expendable landers, the works. Essentially recreating Apollo in 21st century clothing, but not a whole lot of changes when you come right down to it. And of course, I'm not an advocate for any of this sort of thinking. I am a proponent of reusability, of innovation, of new technologies, not doing things the old-fashioned way, not going to the old boys network work of cost plus contracts. Oh yeah, he's also saying that we need to do away with the whole fixed price contract thing if we want to get back to the moon. All of these things are the sorts of arguments that I tend to despise. Why then do I also believe that he might be right about all of this? In the course of this video, I'm going to be quoting extensively from Mr. Griffin's testimony in front of Congress on January 17th of this year, and then I'm going to give you my opinions about what he has to say. And as I said before, it's going to surprise you a little bit when it comes to my reactions. So let's go ahead and get started. Ex-Administrator Griffin argues that NASA, as well as the nation on behalf of which it executes our civil space program, should modify the strategy, tactics, acquisition approach, and programmatic structure of human lunar return as it is presently planned. To the topic of this hearing, and the hearing, by the way, that he's referring to is about keeping the Artemis program on track. However, he says that it should not be kept on track. It should be fixed and then prosecuted with all deliberate speed. He starts off with strategic issues. As we all know, NASA has awarded fixed price contracts to SpaceX and Blue Origin to carry out lunar landings for, respectively, $2.9 and $3.4 billion. They've actually awarded a little bit more to SpaceX since then because SpaceX is going, supposed to be carrying out two lunar landings, not just one, but nevertheless, he's essentially correct. By way of 
of comparison, the cost of the Apollo program over the 14-year period from 1960 to 73 is estimated to have cost $257 billion in adjusted dollars. It's reasonable to believe that with the flight experience and space industrial infrastructure that exists today, human lunar missions could and should be executed for considerably less than Apollo. It is grossly unrealistic to suggest that they could be done for 1.5% of Apollo's cost. The award of these unrealistically low fixed price contracts makes it clear that cost reasonableness was not a factor in ranking these contract awards. The further implication is that the United States is not yet serious about a program that should be regarded as a core national interest. Returning U.S. and international partner astronauts to the moon before our self-declared adversaries can do so. Now, he's not being entirely accurate about all of this. While it is true that the combined budgets for Blue Origin and SpaceX are approximately $6.3 billion, NASA has also spent $11.9 billion so far on SLS. If you throw all of that in, the cost for Artemis is roughly $20 billion or so up to this point and is probably going to balloon out even further by the time Artemis 3 actually takes place. So we're looking at about 10% of Apollo's cost, not 1.5. And by the way, the vast majority of that cost is coming from the launch systems that he's advocating that we keep. However, as you're going to see later in the video, ex-administrator Griffin is right about one thing. These budgets are incredibly unrealistic. But first, let's talk about why we need to increase NASA's budget. Quote, as in the 1960s, we are again faced with near-term peer competition in space, this time with the Chinese Communist Party and, once again, potentially Russia. For the U.S. not to be able to put its own and partner astronauts on the moon, to be watching on the internet while adversary parlors do so, makes a statement about a shift of global power and preeminence that we ought not to allow. People and nations align themselves with leaders. For most of the last 80 years, that has been the United States, in partnership with our European and Western Pacific allies. Are we prepared to relinquish that leadership to China? If not, and if we view preeminence in space as part of that leadership and therefore an element of national security, then it is again necessary to prioritize urgency of execution. He's absolutely right about all of that. We cannot allow China to get to the moon before the United States and Western European powers do. That would be a huge mistake. And the only way that that's going to be headed off is with a considerable increase in government spending. Mr. Griffin points out that when a society can do things that others cannot, it commands a degree of respect that is by itself a valuable national security asset, possibly more so than in many instances of the exercise of hard power. Quite simply, the very best people want to come to the place where the very best things are being done. It is quite instructive to observe how many key figures in the Manhattan and Apollo programs were immigrants, a number that was huge hugely out of proportion to the rest of the population. To quote an observation by former Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Dr. Lisa Porter, the United States is a country where a Six Sigma individual can flourish. They are the people who create, in the words of another quote attributed to JFK, the rising tide that lifts all boats. Space exploration attracts such people. That is something in which we should take pride and is an asset to be nourished. These are the forms of national security that NASA enables and we should take to heart in crafting our national space exploration program. But an even bigger problem than budget is Mr. Griffin argues that the selected mission architectures pose significant concerns says that SpaceX's approach requires an impractically large number of orbital refueling operations for even a single lunar mission. 
He may be right about that as well. He links a story about how a single Starship mission might require 20 refueling operations, although I think that's an exaggeration. SpaceX says it might be as little as 10, but Blue Origin's mission design depends on the development of one of the most difficult enabling technologies for long-duration spaceflight, zero boil-off cryogenic fuel storage. He's right about that as well. Even in the laboratory, achieving zero propellant boil off in space has been almost impossible without lots of insulation, a sun shield, and an active cooling system. That is to say, a cooling system that requires its own power plant in order to keep the fuel cool enough to where it doesn't bleed off into space. Why is this the case, by the way? Well, because anything that you put out into space is being hammered by solar radiation. In other words, lots and lots of heat. Even with a sun shield, supercooled propellant, especially hydrogen, tends to bleed off into space very quickly. And SpaceX is going to run into these problems as well, unless they can manage a very rapid cadence of refueling launches. The longer it takes in between launching these refueling tankers, the more propellant is going to be lost into space, and the more launches you're going to need to make up for that shortfall. Now, to be clear, Mr. Griffin is a strong proponent for this kind of concept. Quote, these architectures feature concepts, cryogenic propellant storage, likely in large depots with low controllable boil off that are critical to long term sustainable human space exploration. But while important, their development is unlikely to be completed easily or quickly. And over the last half century, we have used up the time that could have been devoted to the evolution of Apollo era systems to a more sustainable architecture. Like it or not, we are engaged in a competition with others who do not wish us well and timeliness matters. And actually, he's not wrong about any of that either. Now we need to move on to crew safety. That's a big problem as far as Artemis is concerned as well. He says that the present Artemis mission architecture requires staging operations at the Lunar Gateway with a six and a half day period and dimensions of 3,000 kilometers by 70,000 kilometers altitude above the lunar surface. This approach is said to offer two significant advantages. The Orion spacecraft, incidentally a lot of you may not be aware of this, cannot actually get down to low lunar orbit and then back to Earth on the fuel that it carries. It can only make it to a high lunar orbit like this particular near rectilinear halo orbit that the Lunar Gateway occupies. So once again, to be clear, Orion does not have the Delta V required to get down to a low lunar orbit and then dispatch astronauts to the surface utilizing some sort of lander and then pick up those astronauts in low lunar orbit and get all the way back to Earth. It can't make it there. It can only get to a higher orbit like the one occupied by the Lunar Gateway. And also from this orbit, any sort of mission can be staged to any place on the lunar surface. It's not going to be restricted to equatorial regions the way Apollo missions were. However, as Mr. Griffin points out, these points are trivial in comparison to the major disadvantage of staging from this orbit. And that is the immediate return to the gateway is only possible during 6.5 day centers. In other words, the center point of these types types of orbits. If a lunar crew encounters a problem on the surface that mandates a return to the comparative safety of the gateway, then depending on when that problem occurs, a multi-day wait may be required. With present technology, flying in space is just barely possible. Even in Earth orbit, it is both difficult and dangerous. Expeditions to the moon will be even more demanding. From a safety perspective, no early human lunar mission should knowingly accept the risk of stranding a crew, whether on the surface or in lunar orbit, for days at a time. No mission architecture should be contemplated without, as in Apollo, the capability to leave the surface and rendezvous with a safer habitat within a few hours, somewhat like the first experience of wintering 
over in Antarctica when enough lunar surface infrastructure has been in place to allow a viable long-term shelter-in-place option to be implemented, the crew abort strategy can be reconsidered. Such is not the case for early human lunar return. The Artemis program has not been designed with this consideration in mind. And he is absolutely right about all of that as well. The Lunar Gateway, and especially the orbit that it's been placed in, puts astronauts on the surface of the moon, at least for early lunar missions, in serious jeopardy, the type of danger that Apollo astronauts never experienced. And it gets even worse. Keep in mind that launches to the moon need to be implemented during a particular window. If that window is missed, you usually have to wait a month before you get to try again. Now, let's take the number of operations that are required for Artemis 3 and then plug in some numbers to see what the chance is of it actually succeeding. Let's say that we get Starship operations, that is to say Starship launch cadences, up to 98% efficiency. That's huge efficiency, by the way, that's supposedly going to be attained by late 2026. Nevertheless, let's say they manage to achieve that. Five launches at 98% efficiency is a 90% chance of success. Ten launches, which is the minimum required by SpaceX's own admission of getting Starship to the moon, the chance of success drops to 82%. If you have 15 launches, 74%. 20 launches, 67%, and the numbers just get worse from there. Let's say that Starship only has a 95% reliability by 2026. 10 launches gives it only a 60% chance of successfully delivering a spacecraft to lunar orbit by a particular launch window. And keep in mind, just leaving it sitting in lunar orbit is not a good alternative, because the longer it sits there, the more its propellant is going to bleed off, and the more impossible it's going to be for Starship not only to get down to the lunar surface, but back to lunar orbit to the Orion, and then those astronauts safely back to Earth. And by the way, if it actually turns out that Starship requires 20 refueling missions, the chance of success drops to 36%. And that's if you have a 95% reliability rating for Starship by 2026. Falcon 9 definitely did not have a 95% reliability rating that early in its developmental process. As much as I dislike Mr. Griffin's criticisms, I don't see a whole lot of holes in what he's saying. So what's the alternative? What is he saying we need to do in order to get human beings to the moon by 2030 or so? Well, the answer is go with expensive, expendable, and reliable options. So let's have a look at his architecture as much as I hate it. First of all, he suggests that SLS deploys a two-stage lander plus a Centaur 3 upper stage, or maybe a Centaur 5, assuming that Centaur 5 is reliable by that time, into low lunar orbit. The reason this is needed, you need a two-stage lander because you need the upper stage in order to successfully carry the astronauts back up to orbit once the mission is complete, and you need the Centaur 5 upper stage in order to deliver the lander down to low lunar orbit in the first place, and then to bring the astronauts back home. The Centaur essentially carries the extra fuel. On top of that, you send another SLS with the Orion plus another Centaur upper stage to rendezvous with the lander in low lunar orbit. Again, the Centaur upper stage is required in order to provide the necessary fuel to take Orion down to low lunar orbit and then to bring it all the way back to Earth because Orion on its own does not have enough fuel to get there. Now, of course, this two-stage lander doesn't exist yet. However, a number of small-scale, single-stage landers have been proposed by Lockheed Martin, for example, before they got tangled up in the whole national team debacle, 
That lander looked pretty decent, fully reusable as you can see, able to carry up to four astronauts, and single stage, capable of setting down on the lunar surface, capable of carrying a fair amount of cargo too, by the way, and returning to lunar orbit. I suspect that it would probably require that transfer stage, that Centaur 5 or Centaur 3 upper stage in order to get it to lunar orbit in the first place, but nevertheless, this is one possibility. Another possibility that I strongly advocate, which by the way isn't in Mr. Griffin's proposal, is the Dynetics Alpaca. That too is single stage. It is reusable and you could deliver the entire thing with a single SLS launch, just as Mr. Griffin proposes. And here's another advantage. Alpaca has already passed its preliminary design review. A lot of the work has already been completed on this lander, which means it can get into service a hell of a lot faster than starting over from scratch. So once the astronauts have landed on the surface, they use the upper stage of the two-stage lander to return to orbit, to the Orion presumably, and then the Orion carries them safely back to Earth. What's the problem with this proposal? Well, obviously, it's crazy expensive. We're talking about two SLS launches for every lunar mission. Yeah, fewer launches overall, but far more expensive launches. We're talking eight to ten billion dollars to launch two SLS rockets to say nothing of the cost of developing a brand new lander from scratch. But here's Mr. Griffin's point. We may not have a choice in any of this if we want to get human beings on the lunar surface before 2030, and he might very well be right. Now, we need to talk about one other point, and that's cost plus contracts. But before I do, I'd like to thank our latest Patreon supporter, Michael Young. It's because of folks like you that I can not only release content on a regular basis, but also travel to some very exciting destinations. My next one, I hope, is on February 1st, where I am going to be attending a media event for Dream Chaser, the last opportunity to see this amazing spacecraft before it heads to space sometime in April. So back to contracts. Again, according to Mr. Griffin, quote, the fundamental flaw in the Artemis acquisition approach is the assumption that the U.S. government can and should leverage so-called commercial space for national purposes and that this paradigm is applicable to human space flight. However, it should be clear that no significant fiscal return on investment in human lunar missions can be expected in the foreseeable future without significant government subsidy. He's absolutely right about this too. No company is going to be making huge profits on the moon until the government provides a lot of seed money to do this. Griffin goes on to say it is thus NASA's responsibility to acknowledge that it is the only significant customer for human missions to the moon, and it must establish and develop a credible cost estimate to implement that design rather than agreeing to unrealistic, firm fixed price bids for complex development programs. Government fixed price contracts that are underbid leave both sides stuck in a bad deal with only a few possible but unsatisfactory outcomes. The contractor demands additional money to finish the program and the government pays it. The program is ultimately canceled because the government doesn't want to pay or performance is reduced in a compromise between the amount of money the contractor wants and what the government is willing to pay. There is a long and depressing history of such efforts. We should not add human lunar return to the list. Now, I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but he's right. Now, that doesn't mean I think we need to go back to cost plus contracts where companies like Boeing can just exploit the hell out of the taxpayer. However, the fixed price contracts that have been agreed on for these human landing systems are simply not realistic. They require that billionaires donate a hell of a lot of their own money in order to get the job done. And given the fact that Elon Musk has already sunk tons of his 
his own money into Twitter and other ill-advised ventures, and given the fact that Jeff Bezos is notorious for not investing his own money when he can get somebody else to pay the bill, I think it's very realistic to expect that in the future, both of these companies are going to be demanding extra money from the government, while at the same time not delivering a lunar landing by September of 2026. And if that happens, Congress is very likely to cancel the whole damn thing. So is Griffin right about all of this? Well, I guess the safest thing for me to say is that he's not wrong. I'm not necessarily a big fan of his solutions, but I think that if we do intend to get back to the moon, the government needs to get serious about it, and we need substantially more investment than what NASA is currently given. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.